Russia is considering a temporary disconnect from the World Wide Web to test cybersecurity and possibly move towards an autonomous Russian internet infrastructure. But can they even do that? Just up and leave the internet? Will they be able to watch cat videos? Is there some owner of the internet who can stop them? As you may have noticed, the internet is huge. It's a global network that connects computers around the entire world. I can be in Barcelona and theoretically access the exact same websites that I do in Los Angeles. You know, so long as local laws and digital rights management permit. Something this huge can't be owned by any one entity. Instead, it's a hierarchy of structures with lots of smaller owners along the way. It starts with you. When your computer or smart device is connected to the internet, you become a teeny tiny part of it. You rely on an internet service provider, or ISP, to physically connect you to everyone else. Actually, you rely on multiple ISPs which form tiers of networks. The tiers are determined by network size, which also dictates whether they transfer data by paying for the transit across larger networks or share it with other similarly sized networks for mutually agreed upon benefits. At the lowest level is a tier three ISP. These are companies like Comcast or Verizon Communications, and they strictly operate by paying to send their data using bigger, more well-connected networks. They're also known as last mile providers because, well, they're responsible for the last mile of cable that connects your access point to the overall network. Above that is a tier two ISP, which can either pay to send data across larger networks like tier three ISPs, or they share data with networks of a similar size for mutual benefits, what's known as peering without charge. Nowadays, they can also provide that last mile service like tier three ISPs and their companies like British Telecom and Vodafone. And finally, above that are the tier one ISPs, the huge networks that own the cables connecting entire continents. These companies are also known as backbone internet providers. They connect to other tier one ISPs to exchange traffic through peering agreements. And just like that, you have a global network of computers. Considering how huge and complex it is, it's pretty incredible the thing works at all. That's all thanks to several organizations, many of which are nonprofit, that standardize how the internet works globally. They each have their own responsibilities, like setting standards, maintaining architecture and stability, and assigning each domain name with a unique IP address. These organizations don't own the internet, but they have a profound effect on how the whole thing works. Likewise, the internet can be regulated in specific places based on the local government's rules, like China's censorship laws or the US's rules on net neutrality. So if Russia's government wanted to disconnect from the rest of the World Wide Web, ultimately that's up to them. If you wanted to be a bigger part of the internet, you could make a website you'd need a specialized computer called a server, which is like a beefy computer with a lot of storage space, and it's designed to communicate with other computers. There are actually a lot of server types, like email and domain name system servers, but your website would be stored on a web server at a data center somewhere. Now, imagine your website is awesome because it's just got the best pictures of cats on it ever. It's so popular, someone on the other side of the world wants to access it. Then the entire pipeline looks like this. You pay a web host, which owns web servers, to use one or part of their servers to store your data, or in this case, CATA. Let's say your particular web server is connected to a tier two ISP. So the data is sent to a tier one ISP, which shares that data with another tier one ISP, which distributes it to lower tier ISPs until eventually it winds up at your number one fan's computer on the other side of the globe. Now, I made that sound pretty linear, but actually the data is broken up into smaller chunks called packets, which are routed from a server using many paths through the networks until they're reassembled on a person's computer. Unless that person was, say, in Russia during the temporary disconnect. That user can still access cat memes on web servers that are in Russia somewhere and connected to Russian ISPs. But if those ISPs don't exchange data with anyone outside the country, then effectively there's a virtual wall between them and the outside world. Likewise, you would miss out on any Russian cat videos you wanted to see outside the country. Everywhere along the way, someone owns a part of the internet. It's your website, but a web host server. It's their server, but an ISP's network. It's their network, but they need to connect to an even bigger network. And then there are other equally big networks that they need to connect to in order to make the whole thing global. So everyone connected to it owns the internet and nobody does. Pretty cool.
Do you think you can go without global internet? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more science in your day. If you like internet news like this, check out Marin's video about how we can possibly make the internet faster with twisted light. Thanks for watching, fellow internet consumers, and I'll see you next time on Secret.